great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's what a great conference, and uh, congratulations to Anthony Wood and his team for this absolutely brilliant, brilliant conference. I believe the future of tall buildings is affected by three factors, time, place, and context. These are critical factors and really important, especially designing a historic context. The now is we're in the 21st century, and it's to the context is totally different. We're working around listed buildings, but critical for me is climate change, which I'd just like to start with. The energy side of projects. All of energy comes from the sun. Without it, there would be no life on Earth. It allows our, project, our planet to, to thrive, but also, and gives all life. But also, it can cause death, havoc, destruction. And I was interested in this idea of taming the sun. And it's a, there's actually a novel by uh, Gavin Bishop, who's a, talk about, is a, a Maori um, in New Zealand, talking about taming the sun. It's about fishermen who actually try and slow the sun down so they can actually fish for longer during the day. And I thought it was a really interesting uh, idea. And combine that with... The other book I've always been fascinated by, by Tanizaki, which is called um, In Praise of Shadows. And it's absolutely about looking at, looking at shadows rather than light. And these two together, for me, summarizes Corb's um, statement that the, masterly, the architecture is a masterly correct, a magnificent play of masses brought together in light. So the sun needs to be tamed, understood, respected, and all architecture um, is architecture of the sun. We need to respect both the light and praise the shadows. And I think there's been a, an overspill of this into more light and less shade. So I believe we're searching right now for a new architecture, which moves away from the, the direction of the last half of the 20th century, and we take stock and bring us bang up to date. Because we're going to run out of oil, it will decrease in the next few years and become expensive. There are fewer sources around the world being discovered, and we're beginning to run on empty. And 50% of the energy in buildings relates to the shape and its external wall. It's an element where the technology and the art meet the environment, to tackle the environment. And I believe we have to be more responsible. I don't believe we can carry on working the way we have been. It's completely irresponsible the way we've been working. We need to pursue change in both social and uh, built sustainability. And it's the heart of everything we do at MAKE. There's been an orgy of glass. Energy was so cheap, um, it's cheaper to seal a building rather than open the windows, and we've sort of made these buildings without any sort of real regard to the environment. I think it's all just out of date, and the way we used to use design without a care in the world for energy. And many glass buildings have got the same performance all the way around, 360 degrees, which is very curious, because the performance of each facade is completely different. So we started a campaign, I think it was actually at the Dubai um, Tall Buildings Conference uh, about six, five, six years ago for the death of the glass box. And we've been campaigning, we believe it's a moral duty that it should be consigned to history. It's no longer the right time, using one of my three uh, time context um, statements, to keep seeing glass boxes. But the regulations still allow you to do this, especially in London, and hopefully they will change and get m more stringent over the years and maybe the glass industry will wake up and give us some better products. So both concepts of taming the sun and death the glass box just now minds a search for a new architecture and to reduce the carbon footprint of our projects. And I think the future proofing that we're talking about today is all about new ways of thinking. There's no doubt there's a population boom, there's no doubt global urbanization uh, ticks many boxes for tall where space is at a real premium. And I think you only have to look back for the clues in what we should be doing. High thermal mass, perimeter structures, integration of cladding and structure to maximize performance. Just pause that for a moment. Let's come back to that. Looking at time, place, and context. Let's look at the 20th century in New York. Fantastic city, plan with towers in mind, scaled for the car, scaled for the tower. And it's basically a set of rules, prescribed rules, that allow you to build these buildings at a tour. And it works because Central Park's there as a sort of pressure valve that allows um, New York to be very dense, but the park is a sort of contrast to the outdoor space. Whereas Hong Kong, which is probably the most fantastic place on Earth, and I really love going there, has almost no outdoor space. But it seems to sort of feed on pure energy. And I saw to Ian Simpson earlier, Ian never actually been to Hong Kong. I said, as soon as you go there, Ian, you never want to come back. It's just fantastic. So 
bringing that to contrast with London right now, in today. Within the city walls, there's many, many constraints where the market actually meets history. There's strict planning, but there's no rules. Nothing's prescribed as it is in New York. And there's lots of consultation. We build high to make sense of land values and the desire to keep people in the city. You can see the relationship there with Canary Wharf uh, in the background of that shot. The city's become a collection of dissimilar objects, which I think is absolutely brilliant. The symbol of the world financial center, its importance, it keeps competitive, and going tall is often seen as the answer to our problems, economic, social, and even environmental. But the reality is we need to keep creating a community at local and regional levels that always must be considered as part of that context which I mentioned earlier. And the context is extreme. There's conservation areas everywhere. It's not impossible to build high in conservation areas. There's lots, lots uh, open to negotiation and debate. And of course, there's listed buildings. <clears throat> and the most famous of which, of course, is St. Paul's. This fantastic uh, painting by Canaletto, one of the most famous, shows St. Paul's and all the city churches. Lots and lots of towers, interestingly enough. And St. Paul's is a Wren's masterpiece, and quite rightly, needs to be looked after. And for those who don't know, there's invisible lines in the sky from various viewpoints that protect the view of the Dome of St. Paul's. My favorite being the one on the right there, which is 14 miles away with a 400 millimeter lens through the hole in the hedge um, from Richmond. But I think the best future uh, St. Paul's will be the de Gherkin. I think it will be listed. <coughs> I think it should be protected. I think there will should now be people mapping out those invisible lines for the Gherkin for the future. I think it will end up being protected. Maybe not now, but maybe in 20 years' time. It's a fantastic icon, and it's really, for its time, very energy efficient. And the next significant landmark, like uh, from the Gherkin, is the Shard. Again, it's in context, almost echoes Wren spires, in, but a different scale, a today's scale from the Canaletto painting. And it pops up everywhere as a marker. Could there be a new cluster near the Shard? Could there be more towers near the Shard? Or would it stand pretty much alone for the foreseeable future? I love the way it reacts strongly with its sort of historic context. It just pops up in front of historical buildings, behind historical buildings, and it's designed for this time, this moment in time. And it reacts very strongly to its place and its context. And that will evolve over time. I also love the contrast, the old and the new. The fact you've got an old building next to a new building. If it was designed today, again, would it be the same all the way around, or would it actually be slightly different? And what about if you did it again in 10 years' time, would it be slightly different because of the way energy uh, constraints are coming on us? But it's still a fabulous building. And I'm sure, not sure, Stefan Balconel, who did this sculpture many years before the Shard was built, actually knew the Shard was going to be there because this guy's looking at the Shard, which I think is a fantastic view it's from more London. Switching to Canary, with the city on our far left here, you can see Canary, uh, center stage. The foreground, you've got Indigo Jones, a uh, fantastic Greenwich building. Um, Canary was a different planning regime. It just delivered what the market wanted, simple, highly efficient boxes. There was little negotiation or debate outside the client body, and they became the design guardians, and I think did a pretty good job. The buildings are simple, cool, pure, efficient, and actually uh, exactly what the market was after. And a contrast, I quite enjoy the contrast with the city of London, with its sort of shapes, and this uh, canary being a series of simple, pure forms. So turning to the city with a shard on the left here, you can see what we've achieved so far. Other than the um, Pepys Tower in Deptford, which seems to have appeared in the middle of that photograph, in my view, for the first time, um, we've got a, a walkie-talkie. Uh, we've got a cluster, sorry, with a walkie-talkie having on a sort of slight walkabout outside the cluster. Um, but it's a fantastically exciting place to work. It's the best place to work in the world, all by negotiation, nothing prescribed. You've got Willis, Cheese Grater, Tower 42, the Gherkin Heron. And compositionally, I think it's looking really, really good and vital and, and really alive. And the key views across the river from the Canaletto show a similar image, in a way, for the 21st century. Towers, St. Paul's protected. And I'm looking forward to Peter Reese's river cruise tomorrow. He's going to tell us all about it. Presumably, you'll only be looking north, Peter, rather than south on your riverboat tour. But I think it's great to see that, that cluster around St. Paul's. And it's been 
It's been an interesting uh, part of the last uh, period where actually before 2008, we were sort of trying to outshape each other with, with towers in London. Um, everything has a shape. They all have a name or a nickname. And they're all currently designed pre-crash. Even the new ones that are being built now are designed pre-crash. And I think the next generation will be more rational, for a while anyway. Because London cannot be like Paris. It cannot just be basically set in aspic at six stories high. London is a world financial city, and Paris is more like a six-story museum, with all the commercial buildings as consigned to Ladder Falls. Meaning that the vitality is split between the city and La Défense. And London, as Peter would tell us, is more like a kitchen garden where the paths, either the roads, the squares, would stay. The specimen plants, the listed buildings would stay. But generally, crops are grown, harvested, and new things are planted. And when you move outside the city, it's a series of villages. And for Southwark and Lend-Lease, we've been working on the Elephant and Castle for about... Um, as long as we can all remember, probably about 16 years, um, setting that kitchen garden plan. And basically, it's a link together, to stitch together that community into the wider community and actually uh, make a new place. And in that, there's nine towers, or with planning permission, um, going from 30 stories to 14 stories, uh, st setting down from the um, strata and number one, the elephant. And it's a mixed series of residential typologies. Um, it creates a much enhanced area for the area of Southwark. It was desperately in need of regeneration. And the towers decreased in height for number one, the elephant, um, and the strata, which are sort of, in a way, a symbol of that, that um, whole area. But it's all about creating fantastic spaces, all about making a new park for people for the first time in 80 years. And basically, at the end of the park, the symbols of towers actually define the edges of that park, rather like Central Park in New York. So it's two and a half thousand homes. It's going to be an amazing, amazing place. But just to pull it back and say, what happened before that? What happens if you work outside these very historic contexts? And let's look at the Middle East for a while, um, where the spaces in London are more important than the buildings, whereas actually probably the buildings in the Middle East are more important than the, the spaces. The demand for space isn't really there. Um, the cost of land isn't the same as a European city, but despite that, there's an intrinsic desire to go tall uh, for kudos, for image, even in a desert where you've got loads and loads of land. And we all got tied up in this. We did some really amazing work in the Middle East, in the heady days of the mid-2000s. Uh, this is our, our stellar tower. The value at the top was uh, the, the values at the top were better than the values in the middle, so it got wider towards the top. Uh, later adopted by the walkie-talkie. The facades angled downwards to reduce solar gain and the skirts collect rainwater. And we did one kilometer high vortices um, also for that market, which was all in gold, as you can see from the image. And that started a single vortex, actually, from a, a scheme nine years ago we did in London here uh, on the Bishopsgate site. And again, putting the space at a high level uh, where it was more value. And it caused a bit of a stir. Peter said to me, it looks like you used all the bits you had, Ken, when you finished designing the gherkin. And he sort of said it was like matter and antimatter, and so they could never exist together. So that, that sort of moved on as a project. A more sensible pre-crash, we did uh, work on the spherical in Leeds for HGB, uh, where the windows vary in depth, clad in aluminium. We worked on, in Docklands, with Barrogate, uh, Twin Towers, uh, over a McDonald's at the bottom, so all the amenity spaces didn't fit at the bottom. Um, the claddings respond to the function, and the amenity spaces went up in the air onto these sort of uh, terraces. And in a way, it's a fantastic scheme, but it's not that crazy. It wasn't that mad before the recession. On the river, we had five towers, four resi, one hotel, with gardens and docks, all views of the river um, looking out. Even those at the back had views of the river. And in the desert, we were doing mad things. <coughs> this is a hotel concept. It was absolutely great fun. Um, and another desert building, amazing briefs. Rolls Royces had to drive into the lift, go up to the front door of the residency, and you come out into your apartment. Um, sort of pre-crash. This sort of seemed normal to most of us. Uh, and we have a cupboard full, as suppose everybody else does in the room, of such schemes for the Middle East. That all changed with the death of bling 2008, when the subprime mortgages started a ripple effect around the world. And I said it was the end of silly shapes, 
silly profiles, crazy shapes, and double curves. Over, I said, but it's probably just paused. Not everyone, um, it hasn't actually paused for everybody. Some people are still doing it. But for most of us, submerged in the sort of trying to reality, the reality of creating value, it's, it's over. So refreshingly, the time, the place, the context after 2008 is back to basics, back to Mies, Euclidean linear geometries, less pressure to outshape each other and get back to an age of reason. And our tower for Menta in Croydon, which is one of the tallest towers in Europe, residential, so it's become a series of towers, a vertical expression, and the qualities on the materials, because the scheme we did do before the crash was actually more flamboyant, and it really reflects the time in about 2006, 2007. Exciting, but actually, all the flats are single aspect, and actually, these are all double aspect, and the new tower has better uh, cross-ventilation, double aspect, fantastic transport, and more efficient. Uh, so we focus on the materials rather than the shape. And we create a new public space, raised a new bridge over the tracks to central Croydon. And it basically creates a new cluster in Croydon. Vertical expression with the amenity spaces dotted around um, within the tower. But it's down to a sort of pure elegance and simplicity. And I work in Sydney, again, vertical expression, uh, but actually grouping the apartments here vertically one above the other as, as the same type to break down the mass on the harbour front. So it actually slots in really well into the Sydney uh, harbour views. And the sort of warmth of the colours comes through from that particular area. Closer to home, central London, we're working on a simple, pure, rational tower. Very straightforward. With different studies being looked at the cladding and the way the expression of the apartments can be expressed on the outside. And for me, it's about exploratory process of balancing that light and shade, balancing the taming the sun um, with the praising the shadows and trying to get that absolutely right for the orientation and the different uh, locations. Our tower for Rocket Investments at, uh, number city, at uh, city Road, 40-story um, residential tower, triangular site, concrete expression, um, right on a roundabout which is developing very fast in London. Again, with a new public space, expression of balconies between fins um, held with a sort of simplicity, but actually a step profile. So actually against the skyline, it's distinctive, but it's pretty sensible. No double curves, no silly shapes, just working uh, to today's rules. And just briefly before, after the um, crash, looking at the north of England, and this is a one tower Ian Simpson's not actually doing, um, north of the Watford Gap. Um, it's a new type of tower. It's an area of North of England. Everybody likes to live in uh, houses with gardens. And the idea was to bring that back into the city, to make residences uh, with a hotel below. On the back is a sort of double stair, double stitch back stair you see, like lacing, which you'll see in a moment in, in Broadgate. But it had double height spaces for gardens, for barbecues, up in the sky, one home per floor, privacy. Um, it was interlocked. <coughs> And the deep spandrels reduce the solar gain, but increase insulation. Um, and basically you create a series of sort of unique uh, residences, almost like houses in the sky. Unlike anything else, a sort of country house in the sky. With fireplaces, with fantastic views. And time, place, context, coming back to my hometown, Birmingham, 2006, the commission pre-crash. Uh, pre a truly mixed-use project. Uh, in Birmingham, a tower, uh, maybe not in so, so much in the, in the Far East, but 20 stories high. Um, it's got car park, shops, offices, residential, hotel, and, res and a restaurant on the roof. And it has this incredible space that links the whole thing together, from below ground to the top to the restaurant, um, which links all the functions, is the heart of the space. A simple cube on the outside, more complicated, more twisted on the inside. It's like a small town. You could live, um, work, and die in this building. Everything, everything's here for you. And it comes from the idea of relating it to Birmingham. Birmingham has uh, had two manufacturing industries, the really heavy metal plate industries of the car industry um, and the glass light bulb jewelry industry. And we put those two together, where the outside of the building um, reflects the heavy metal industries and the inside is sort of, it's more crystalline, more glassy, it reflects the, the jewelry and the, the glass and light bulb industry. And these two come together in these fantastic gardens in the sky, villages, sorry, um, which basically create these great terraces with this incredible fretwork screen you look through uh, to the outside. 
And the screen is basically trying to disguise the different uses. And it comes from a sort of return to basics with Georgian House, Windows, um, a, a sort of a reference point for Windows with actually solid parts between. And I actually become more fascinated with the space between the windows and the windows themselves. And I started to read plus signs on the windows, between the windows. I started to do paintings about interlocking fields, and the interlocking fields became like overlapping planes. And those evolved into an incredible um, series of drawings by the office, um, looking at in computers, looking at a sort of Tetris um, matrix, which blends the functions together, hides the differences, produces a unifying whole. And because it reverses at night, you see this fretwork screen. And I believe it could only be in Birmingham. It could only be pre-commissioned, commissioned pre-2008. And I believe it rates strongly in contrast to its, to its context. Time, place, context, back to London. 1985 in Broadgate. Fantastic. The Big Bang and bring large-scale floor plates into the city of London. The kitchen garden in action here. Um, streets, squares, spaces are there forever. Buildings come, on, come and go. Continue to be a great space. Broadgate is being enhanced at by Arab, uh, being upgraded. And you fast forward 25 years to 2013, and the demand now from UBS is for much bigger floor plates. Ground scrapers, where space allows everybody to be on one floor. And the replacement of the older gas-guzzling buildings come up for renewal. We started from scratch. The brief was a football pitch size, floor plate 130 by 50. And we looked at the way to sort of uh, think about this building in terms of the outside and the way it should actually be composed and the way we should look at the functions on the inside coming through to the outside and making actually a, a building that is completely different to any other building around. We had a great client in British land and with, uh, with UBS as well. And they created this incredible brief to allow us to do a completely new building, which is actually not just a tower, just big ground scrapers more efficient, which will be the tower hands down when the land's available. And there's room, I think, in the city for both. But it started with the idea of a sort of solid object. And in Taming the Sun, we looked at a solid object being carved or even cast, and then designed all the glass where it actually was needed. Um, so we sort of still on its head the way we normally used to design. We look at solid box, uh, which is completely solid, and we just worked out new ways of making models in the office, making castings, and then cut into those models and actually worked at where we actually needed spaces for, for daylight, for windows, for atriums, and the building becomes clad in stainless steel, um, one of the biggest stainless steel projects ever built. Uh, the panels are nine meters long and working directly with Mace and Sealer, um, formed a, a series of these very large-scale mock-ups um, to ensure we got the balance right between the, um, so I'm giving two minutes here. No, it says it's more on my thing. Um, balanced natural daylight and uh, with excellent views and high levels of thermal and solar insulation. And the stairs express the stairs, a bit like you saw on that town in the north. It's being built right now. It's got a very good energy story. Uh, it's only 35% glazed. And the windows are placed where they're needed to tame the sun. And the environmental performance we've explored, we see design as an exploratory process the last nine years. We looked at Grove and the Waterside, again, locked into Chelsea, um, sort of champagne colours, working with the arts and crafts movement, working with an artist called Claire Woods to work on the facades. In Hanover Square, working with um, Catherine Batola, on again, working with an artist, uh, looking at Hanover uh, patterns that went into uh, that area and using those on the building, linking, long, linking them into their context. And Ridgeford working on the uh, where windows should actually be using weathering materials, put the windows where they're needed. It's fantastic to have a horizontal window in the bedroom, uh, maintains privacy, has some great quality of light and great views in the morning. And using even straw, but in sort of bales that suggests that the panels are put where they're keeping the sun out. This is only 25, 20% glaze on the south side. And a building for Crown Estate, the same with a horizontal expression, looking at, again, where the windows are needed. There's more horizontal glazing uh, on the north side than the south side. And each project is looking at different ways of exploring that, that taming of the sun, that taming, that um, praising the shadows. And finally, 
I've got six seconds apparently, but I can do it in about five, about, about two minutes. So in a city in Central Europe, looking at a scheme that responds to a city square, it's a sort of asymmetrical site, and the scheme has been carved and crafted to respond to that site. There's been literally hundreds and hundreds of versions, all slightly different, and there's been a big uh, process doing this. Back to painting again to explore the geometry. And it's metallic, rather like a um, Japanese dovetail chisel, and it's only 40% glass. The rest of it is solid, stainless steel, highly insulated. And it's a play on squares, uh, reflecting the industry of that particular city. But actually, the chisel's quite a soft form on the horizon, and it changes as you move around, which I think gives it a really interesting form. And it works with the two existing objects in that city and defers to them. So it works in its context, it's in a place, reflects the time in which it's in, where it was designed. And I believe these, to conclude, the three factors, time, place, and context, and cultural issues are critical considerations for the future of tall buildings, and ignore them at your peril. And I believe the future of tall buildings always be pitched against ground scrapers, but they need to be energy efficient, related to the time in which they're built, without gas guzzling glass, in modern materials, and relate to place and respond to context. But above all, need to relate and create communities, not destroy them. Thank you.